You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. This episode of the Sketchnote Army Podcast is brought to you by Neuland, the innovative maker of visual thinking tools. Every Neuland product is designed with passion to be durable and sustainable. Check out their newly redesigned Neuland Fine One line of water-based refillable markers. The rich black permanent outliner and bullet and brush options. The crisp, fine lines and rich colors of the sketch line. The flowing, variable brushes and colors of the art line. Save 15% with code AMB290425 at Neuland.com until December 31st, 2020. In this episode, I talk with David Britton, a co-founder of the powerful drawing tool for tablets, Concepts. We talk about David's path into programming, the philosophy and the origin story of Concepts for tablets. So if you haven't considered Concepts before, this discussion will give you insights into why Concepts works the way it does. Hey everyone, welcome. This is Mike Rohde and I am excited to bring you David Britton from Concepts. Uh, to talk a little bit about the the tool itself and philosophy and things that David does to keep himself uh, sane in this COVID time where we're all working in interesting new ways. Uh, David, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Uh, thanks for the invite to uh, to come on the show. You're so welcome. You, you've done an amazing job of building a community around uh, around sketch noting, and uh, and we've got to know so many people, uh, you know, our customers through through that community. So very grateful for mm. what you do. Well, thank you so much, David. I, I appreciate those kind words, and I, I know that the tools that you produce, Concepts, has been helpful to me in the work that I do, and I'm sure there's many others uh, who are listening who also use it. And I think there's going to be, after we're done, quite a few people who want to explore the tool and find out uh, if and how it can work for them. So that's that's really the, the goal of these discussions with developers is to expose people to the tools themselves, but also the philosophy yeah. behind them. So um, why don't you tell us who you are and what you do, and then we'll get into your journey into this visualization space by by developing tools. Yeah, sure. So uh, as you maybe can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm from England. Um, I'm, uh, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, have lived here for uh, 10 years now. Hmm. I'm uh, a co-founder of Concepts, which is a sketching app uh, focused on people who think and communicate visually. You know, that's kind of our, our, our goal uh, is to mm-hmm. empower those people. And, uh, and I've been part of the team working on Concepts for, for seven years now. So it's, uh, you know, it's been a, a, lo- a long road. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's good to see your um, dedication to the space. I definitely have noticed, and all the others who've used the tool definitely notice sort of the um, the dedication and passion and um, being there for us. Right? It's uh, there's so many tools that I remember that I've used that suddenly just stop being updated and faded away. And uh, your team has been quite the opposite. It's been really active, which is really great as a user of the tools to see that continuous update and. Yeah, I mean, it, it is something that's really important to us, and and, and sometimes it, it you know it, it's hard, uh, you know, keep, keeping on, uh, you mm-hmm. know, kind of uh, getting those updates and making the you know the the, the business work and add up, and uh, and mm-hmm. and and we've been kind of you know we've had to take a few changes of directions over the years, but uh, we're really really committed to building a tool, uh, you know, to to support uh, sketching and visual thinking and. Uh, you know, and we really love that kind of interaction we have with our customers and, and hearing their feedback and, and being able to respond quickly and, uh, you know, where we can, turning around updates that, that fix issues or add new features, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you know, responding rapidly. So, you know, mm-hmm. not, not, not annual release cycles, but, uh, you know, monthly. Yes, definitely. It's really great to see that. And I'm very curious to know, how did you end up in this visualization space? Like... What drew you to the space, and why are you still here? Yeah, right. Well, it's kind of yeah, it's been a, a long winding road. Um, yeah, I, 
you know, looking back to when I was at school in England, uh, you know, I definitely had a kind of early interest in math and technology. But actually, one of the the to- one of the courses I took, um, you know, for my O levels, which probably dates me for any of the uh, British listeners because mm. uh, they don't exist anymore. Uh, so uh, you take these at sixteen. Um, uh, one of the courses I did was graphic communication, and and I think it was the course that I probably put most work into, and uh, you know, work hardest at uh, and ultimately got the worst grade in so it wasn't a very <laughs> promising start but I, 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 there was definitely something that uh, that grabbed me about that I mean like you know the math side of things was something I was always really strong at and didn't really have to work very hard at but uh, you know I, I really wanted to be good at graphic communication but uh, you know it didn't start out so well <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I was fascinated by computers, the kind of uh, home computers were taking off. And in, in England, that was kind of ZX Spectrum uh, from, from Sinclair, you know, which I guess was the equivalent of Commodore 64 in the US. And mm. so, you know, I, I was kind of uh, spent a lot of time in my teens uh, working, you know, working on that and learning that and, and, and was really interested in artificial intelligence and, and, and graphics. You know, those were the two things mm. that kind of grabbed me. You know, that, that kind of led me down a path at university uh, into, you know, working in, in computing. And I, and I did a, a master's in cognitive science, which was a uh, you know, it's not a very common course. There was a fashion for it for a while where, and basically the idea was to kind of solve how the brain works. And, and to do that, you know, pull together this really multidisciplinary group of people from computer science and psychology and philosophy and linguistics and neuroscience and kind of throw all these students together with all these different backgrounds on, on one course and, you know, kind of see what blossomed. And, and, and it really uh, sparked in me this kind of appreciation of the power of bringing together with uh, people with with differing backgrounds and different ways of thinking, and and kind of the the you know the magic that can happen when when you combine that stuff together, um, you know and and. You know, often academic disciplines have completely different languages, and so finding those common languages, uh, you know, is is part of uh, of how you do that. And obviously, communicating visually, uh, you know, is is one of the most powerful ways of kind of breaking down some of those those boundaries. And I think it's one of the things that sketch noting does, uh, you know, so effectively. So, and actually, as an aside, my master's, I also focused on how the human visual system works. So it's kind of like uh, the the visualization part of things was there. I I then went on to do a PhD and uh, and was looking at uh, designing uh, telecom networks. And, and, And again, it's one of those areas where kind of visually it's a really simple thing to do for humans they go well this is simple you just kind of wire up these things but for computers it's incredibly hard computers are not very good at doing this kind of spatial reasoning uh, that, that, that humans are incredibly good at, uh, at, at doing you know in, in an instant uh, and, and that was in Bristol uh, and uh, at the same time, there was uh, a huge amount of amazing graffiti appearing around Bristol. And mm. that was actually when Banksy was just uh, just mm-hmm. getting started, if you've heard of him. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that was the, oh, yes, definitely. Uh, so after university, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, the dot-com bubble was expanding rapidly. And, uh, and I took a job with a, a UK company called Superscape, who... Uh, who were just coming out of the last kind of virtual reality bubble uh, that happened in the 90s. Um, you know, it's obviously become you know big again recently, but it, it had a, a moment in the 90s and Superscape were focused in, in that area, but the, but the dot-com bubble kind of encouraged them to, to look at the internet and applying that 3D technology to the web. And that's where I really started getting deeply involved with visualization and, uh, mm-hmm. and graphics. And and again, kind of a similar way to the masters in cognitive science, I found the area that I really enjoyed working was where the you know the engineering side for me interacted with or intersected with the design side. So where you know neither engineer or, or designer would be able to uh, make something happen independently or create their best work independently, when they work together, 
then you know the magic happened uh, and you know the you know the, the you could fire ideas off each other and something the artist thought was impossible the engineer would think was simple and something the engineer thought was impossible the artist would go oh no we can easily do this and and you know and and, and you kind of uh, you know create special stuff that way uh, hmm. and we ended up uh, as a, a business becoming a gaming company focused on smartphones and, and so I spent a lot more time working closely with designers and again the best games teams are the ones who pull together the kind of all the, those dis- different disciplines and have them working together really well whether it's visual or audio or motion design and, and, and engineering you know the hmm. that kind of crossover and communication uh, is uh, is where the magic happens Sounds like you're really fascinated by these integration, these transition and integration points where you can collaborate with other perspectives. Uh, it feels like that's repeating, a repeating pattern for you. It, it, it is, and, and, and I think it's an area where uh, a lot of people struggle. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to be very good at what you do, but being able to kind of empathize and understand a different discipline, even if you're not necessarily very good at it, and and kind of trust uh, that the people who work there know their thing, and, mm-hmm. and have them trust you because you're trusting them. <laughs> you know, it's it's actually a very hard thing to do well. Um, and uh, you know, I've heard it come through in some of your your podcasts where people talk about going into kind of. Um, uh, meetings to, to sketch note and you know they're, they're, they're not groups of people they're necessarily familiar with but uh, uh, they they can help enable by you know the, the visualization helps bring people together and helps them communicate mm-hmm. yeah I think that's definitely a, a similar transition collaboration where they sort of overlap and mesh with each other there's if the if the group is open to it it can be yeah i mean you have to be open to it you know that's the Mm -hmm. key right and i think a lot of people who work within disciplines are not necessarily that that open to it but i I love i love that and and i've seen it work really well and and i think as i say the best teams uh, you'll find that's what's happening Mm -hmm. and i've heard long for a long time the best teams are built uh not they're not accidental and i think that's true the more i work in teams like the best teams are there's somebody who's curating these or bringing these people together for their different skills usually in the best teams and sometimes you can be lucky right where these people were just there and maybe not used maybe they they were the the culture of the group was just not there for that to happen and then something changed Mm -hmm. but it seems to me like groups that are built um seem like they have more longevity and more uh, effectiveness, I guess, may be a good way to describe it. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, or or, or, or or at least you need someone who kind of is helping enable and encourage, uh, you know, this this type of thing to happen. Uh, mm-hmm. It's um, it, there's, there's definitely a skill to it. So. Definitely. Well, that's really interesting to hear that you came from that um, from, the, from the space where you came from into visualization. How did, how did all that background? then lead you to co-found and create concepts that that's another interesting story i'd love to hear yeah so uh you know the games industry was what brought me to the u.s and um but you know after probably five or six years of working in the games industry i was i I was kind of it was getting a bit stale for me um i the game you know i think the thing that i found frustrating was it was about about it was that there's no real longevity in games you know mm. the, you, you, or at least at the time i think it's it's changing somewhat now but a game was built and it was done and then you moved on and you know the game maybe had a, a lifetime of a few months uh, it wasn't very long <laughs> so it was you know you put your heart and soul into something and then it either succeeded or failed and even if it succeeded it only succeeded for a few months and yeah. uh, so I was looking to move on and and I also loved the time I had it in Superscape when they were a small company and, and so I was looking to find something that wasn't gaming that got me back in into a small business and uh, I was connected to Ben Merrill who started Concepts um, and uh, ironically I'm a Brit in the US he's an American based in Finland Uh, (laughs) so uh, and and he had a you know he had this really uh, strong vision for for what uh, Concepts uh, he wanted Concepts to be 
And uh, so he had this kind of, you know, strong design and, and product vision. And, and he was looking for someone to work with on the engineering side. And uh, yeah, we just clicked really well. And, and we fitted, you know, into the pattern I've talked about of kind of both being open to kind of the collaboration mm-hmm. and having very complementary skills. And, uh, and so, you know, we kind of, you know, started working together, not particularly formally initially but uh, you know it's uh, after you know i think it's only three or four months we you know we, we kind of committed to doing it long term together hmm. Hmm. oh that's really interesting that um you just you're, you're expats living in other places yeah living, yeah <laughs> right well and and you know actually we, we we didn't even meet each other uh face to face for more than a year uh, you know mm. we uh, and you know i guess this was seven years ago and and the tools weren't as established i think we just you know chatted on skype for the mm-hmm. you know the, mm-hmm. the, the initially Interesting. I have a similar experience with my co-founder, uh, uh, co-creator of the Sketchnote Idea Book, uh, Mike Shiano. We didn't meet each other for man about a year and a half, mm-hmm. and I turned. I happened to go to New York, so we spent a day hanging out, and that was sort of the the ceiling of the deal. We were already working and investing time and trusting each other, but um, that was sort of the spark that got things moving towards actually doing the Kickstarter and delivering all the products. So yeah. I can definitely empathize with that. It's um, There's some benefits to it, right? You can sort of get a sense of a person before you meet them and it makes meeting them a lot of fun. Yeah, um, no, you know, absolutely. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's a lot uh, to, to to working remotely and, uh, and you know, kind of building the trust and, and you know, the, it's strange because, you know, pro- I imagine it was similar for you when we actually met, it, you know, it felt like we'd already met, it, you know, it was, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 yeah. was, it, was it was seamless kind of odd experience. Yeah. 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 You had to remind yourself, oh, I haven't yeah. actually met you before exactly. for, yeah. for the first year, yeah. but you feel like you know each other well. So, although I think the, the surprise for Ben was probably that I'm six foot six, which doesn't mm. come across when you've worked, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> <laughs> everyone when they meet for me for the first time is very surprised at how tall I am. So, mm. yeah. so, so basically both of your necks hurt at the end of the, <laughs> exactly, the meeting, right? Exactly. You, he was looking up and you were looking down uh-huh, the whole time. For sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you met Ben. It sounds like it had that similar collaborative opportunity, right? It sounds like he's uh, more on the design side, had the product vision. You had the technical skills, mm-hmm. and then you're both. It was important that you were both open to this idea of each of you your strengths becoming even more powerful when they would be combined. That's the sense that I have pick up from what you're saying. Yeah, and and you know, and it's still how you know we build features today. We we kind of start out with a, you know, well here's the vision for it, but it, it adapts as I mean, it, it, you know, between engineering and design, there's push pull as the feature kind of uh, moves forward, and and then you know we get customers to give us feedback on it, and there's mm-hmm. push pull there. We we don't kind of start out with a design that's like absolutely locked down and like this is how it's going to be. Um, you know, it, it's always fluid, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and adapts as we learn more about what's possible and, and, and like how a feature feels. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we, we, we just uh, added a feature to in, in an update. Uh, uh, well, two, two features, I guess, related to grids where you can uh, uh, draw aligned strokes, gr- strokes that align with a grid or snap to a grid. And you know the you know we had a vision for it, and the, the first engineering, the first version of it was kind of mathematically right, <laughs> but mm-hmm. it didn't feel very good, and mm-hmm. you know, and and it took quite a lot of uh, you know cycles to kind of uh, get it to actually just feel natural, like the, you know the way uh, you know you'd want to sketch with it. So mm-hmm. we don't get too attached to uh, design ideas or from an engineering perspective how something's working and. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, it was something that we spotted early on and it's done us well throughout developing concepts. Hmm. It seems like you really, your focus is much more on the process and knowing that doing it this certain way, the way that you, the way that you do it, the concepts way, hmm. will produce an output if you're open to the flexibility starting with a uh, starting point and knowing that it's, there's a chance that it's going to shift maybe quite a bit by the time you get to the end 
but it's okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the, there is a downside to that from a traditional point, software point of view in that we don't often know when we're going to finish. <laughs> so mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. it takes us much longer than we imagine to get uh, something done uh, because we think it's more important we get it right. And and, and, uh, and so kind of having that patience and, and not holding yourself to a specific launch date, I think, helps us mm-hmm. there. But, you know, some people struggle with that. Yeah, I suppose that is the the old warning the uh the apple uh maxim which is you know we don't talk about unreleased products you know exactly so exactly i mean we we do generally avoid uh talking about what's uh what's coming in terms of you know being specific at least about dates uh we kind of maybe hint at directions but uh yeah yeah it can lead to disappointment i mean some features we've just never managed to get right uh and yeah so we we've never we haven't launched them uh and uh, we will one day, <laughs> but uh, yes, if we promised them, then it would have been uh, disappointing for users. Right, right. I, I find that very encouraging that you're that you have a certain quality standard that you aim for, and if it doesn't meet that standard, they don't get released because there's certainly plenty of software out there that will just release whatever uh, whatever exists, and you know whether it's good or not. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that sort of uh, your own internal guidance as to when something is prime, ready for prime time and maybe when it needs more gestation sometimes it sometimes the timing just has to be right yeah i mean i think it's very easy for software just to collect features and, and you know just to you know treat it as a bag of like add this add this add this and and you know we we we, we you know consciously try to avoid that we're we're Mm-hmm. We, we know where we want to head and, and how we want it to feel and work and the, the quality definitely uh, is, a, is a big driver for us so this is kind of this is something I talked with uh, George on the on paper by we transfer and I find it really fascinating maybe I'm the only nerdy guy who's thinking about this but tell me a little bit about the philosophy behind concepts because the reason I ask this I think I always approach a tool I always approach a, a problem looking for a tool that has the right philosophy that will help me achieve the goal. So, you know, I, I will use concepts on certain things and maybe on other things, maybe I wouldn't, I would use something else. And it's nothing against the tool, it's simply that there's a, a certain thing I, w- I mean to achieve and the best tool for that job is concepts or something else. So talk to us a little bit about philosophy so we as users can understand where you and Ben are coming from and wh- why did you produce concepts and why does it act the way it does and why does it do the things that it does that that i think is really interesting for me mm-hmm. sure yeah so uh, you know uh, the the origin of concepts was just a deep frustration i think with some of the early um uh, apps on ipad that were were you know focused on sketching and the 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 no one had really kind of stepped back and rethought how an app should work on um on iPad, if if you were building from from that starting point, and so that's you know where we started, and uh, you know it was obviously tough in the first few years because there was no stylus. You know we we mm. were building, uh, and and you know there were some third party styli, and and uh, you know some of them uh, became decent, but uh, it, it was definitely a struggle until the the Apple Pencil came along. And, you know, finally, we had a, an accurate, responsive stylus. And, uh, you know, that was kind of w- what we'd been building for. So this kind of stylus first, uh, tablet first uh, philosophy of, of, of building for, for, for the device um, was, was definitely a, a big part of it. But the other was, you know, focusing on, um, you know, the early part of design you know, concepts is about sketching, it's about rough ideas, it's about, um, you know, enabling people who think or, or communicate visually to kind of, you know, this is their power tool. Concepts can be used for, you know, more refined uh, illustration and design work, but, you know, our real focus is, is kind of that early ideation phase. And, and, you know, and part of that, I think, is, you know, part of the philosophy there is that sketches, you know, people 
look at sketches uh, you know when they're shown a sketch or when they're working with a sketch it, you you approach it differently you think differently about the 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 sketch you know if, if i show you a sketch of a user interface versus a figma mock-up of a, a user interface then you'll give me very different feedback even if those are of the same thing right because the the sketch is a lot looser uh it's uh you know invites kind of higher level discussion perhaps than the the high resolution uh, mock-up where you'll maybe be going well that offset's wrong and i don't like the font there you know yeah you tend to focus on different things i i noticed that quite early on when i was doing many years ago doing work with clients that if i showed them if i showed them something too finished too soon their feedback um approach would change they would get they would focus on the colors and the typefaces and the size, like all these things which were valuable, but not at this point. And so uh, my approach was always to share sketches mm -hmm. and the whole process. I would always share them early and I would explain every sketch. Um, lots of work that I did back in those days was um, logos and icons. And so I would actually share many uh, not for the light of day sketches with my clients and explain which ones were bad and why they were terrible ideas. But I would always explain to them, you know, I'm sharing everything because I don't want you to feel like we, we didn't, oh, we didn't go down this path and maybe that was the solution, mm -hmm. right? That nagging feeling in the back of your head that, oh, had we just done this thing, that would have been a better solution. Well, like, no, because we actually did that and it was a terrible idea and here's why it's terrible. Whether it was good or bad, they were all in that process. And I think th the customers that I worked with really appreciated that because they were part of the process. They could see my thinking and had, uh, you know, each piece had a rationale behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I definitely agree with that approach to keeping sketching in the process and having, having that ability on the iPad is really valuable, especially with concepts and the flexibility that I think we can talk a little bit about too that sort of, I think, sets you apart from some of the other tools on the market, at least from my perspective, is the idea that I can sketch in a pencil and then switch over to ink. And if I, if I don't like that, I can actually select those objects because they're vectors and make modifications. And in fact, I have a really interesting story, which I, I don't know that I've told you before, but um, I did a, a pretty big project. It was going to be printed very large behind some kind of a uh, display for a customer mm -hmm. and uh, I did this whole it was basically sp supposed to look like a blueprint and I used a a pen sort of a you know gel gel pen mm -hmm. tip that that I started with and tweaked a little bit I did all this drawing and we presented it to the customer I worked with a, with another team and they wrote back and said um, the customer says it's too perfect it's too clean can you like can you do this in pencil? I was like, oh man, <laughs> I'm going to have to redraw this whole thing. And I, wait a minute, I did this in concepts. This is all vectors. And I'm a long time user of vectors from Adobe Illustrator. And so I said, well, I'm going to first try and see, can I just select some of these elements and switch hmm. the brush? And so that's what I did. I started with a small chunk and I switched the brush. I was like, ooh, that, that looks pretty good. And then I just kept working my way through the whole illustration, chunk by chunk, switching it from ink to pencil. It probably took, I don't know, it's probably an hour, hour and a half of work. But by the end, like that would have been five or six hours right. of ink drawing, certainly, right? Yeah, so yeah. from my perspective, that was a huge savings. And then once I had the feel, I could look and say, you know, that when I switched that piece the pencil tip looked too soft. So I would go back in with uh, a tighter pencil and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a narrower width yeah. and I would sharpen, sharpen it and hit it <laughs> right. a little bit more. And so I basically, I basically converted to pencil and reworked the whole, the whole illustration with pencil until I got it to the point where I liked it and turned it in and the client loved it. It was great. It was fantastic. So nice. Um, yeah. That, that worked really well. So that was a case where, seeing having vectors and being able to do some on the fly changes was really valuable for me and i'm sure maybe we can talk a little bit about that and what the benefits are that you see from a concepts perspective of vectors and what you've heard from your customers yeah i think uh you know the the users love that you know vectors will give us the the, the infinite canvas so mm -hmm. we don't have to kind of set set a, a page boundary up front and so as you're kind of sketching your ideas you they can just flow and expand and uh and then you know 
you can reorganize because you can select everything and move it around and uh, mm-hmm. and and as you say you can you can change colors and and and, str- uh, and to different pen types so you know you, you can let all the ideas come out and not worry about it because you can relax mm-hmm. because you know say you've got to the end of the session and you need to tidy things up or or, or reorganize stuff that that's all possible you don't have to start again um, so it, yeah it, it brings a lot of power uh, and I, I think one of the a, a lot of uh, vector apps, you know, uh, are very uh, you know technical in how you use them. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things in concepts we try to do is bring the benefit of vector, but not make it feel vector. So it feels mm-hmm. like uh, you know a, just a sketching, you know, regular sketching app. We have pencils that have a a real kind of natural feel to them. And as you tilt the pencil, it starts shading. And you know we have um, you know Copic markers that look like you know real world markers and have that kind of organic feel to them. So kind of blending the the vector and raster world and bringing the best of both together is you know what we try to do Hmm. Hmm. i would imagine there must be in in any of these tools it would make sense that um there's probably some vectorization or at least the mathematics behind it is going on behind the scenes with the tool itself whether or not they're represented as vectors so Hmm. I, i imagine that with concepts you simply chose to allow those to be editable where maybe in some cases tools are hiding that right they don't give you access to select a point and move it or select a bunch of points and move them yeah i, I mean it, you know the, there are definite you know there are advantages to being raster only you know you mm. you as soon as you've kind of the the pen has, has touched the canvas you can kind of just save those pixels and then they're, mm. they're pixels forever uh and uh you know that, that that has areas where that's an advantage. We have to work very very hard in concepts to deliver performance because every time mm. you pan or zoom, you know we have to draw mm-hmm. everything again from scratch. And uh, yeah, that's a good point. It's uh, you know that that's taken a lot of engineering to deliver the level of performance that we do. Um, and you know, very uh, we take a, a big advantage of uh, of the graphics units on the. Uh, Mm. on the devices and it's where you know some of my gaming background comes in essentially concepts runs on on something like a gaming engine in in terms of the way we we render interesting interesting that's 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 a really great again bringing in this crossover between different worlds to produce something interesting and new Mm -hmm. which is really cool yeah yeah i sort of see in my perspective is um because you're because you've decided to go with this vector approach I kind of see a natural outflow is um, I don't know what the what the feature is called, but it is this idea of being able to create icon libraries, either to purchase them mm-hmm. or to download them. Right there's this whole library of right. people who've pr- produced them. But what's really fascinating to me is the ability to make your own because I'm such a proponent of creating a visual icon library of your own work mm-hmm. that you could actually draw, a, you know, have a template of some kind that would you know set a certain size. And just sit there and build a whole library and then drag these symbols into a library, into the library area, yeah. whatever that's called. And then be able to, while you're doing sketching, say, like, oh, that's right, I've already drawn that and drag it out. And then if you, you know, say you switch to pencil, you could convert those vectors into pencil mm-hmm. or something if you right. wished or, yeah. right. You, you, that's a really, I would love to have you talk a little bit about that feature because I, I think people who have not tried concepts don't realize that that's a feature. And I think... Especially for sketch noters, that could be a real game changer for some people to realize that that's an option. Yeah, yeah. So we we, we have uh, uh, what we call uh, our object library, uh, which is uh, a set of um, you know I guess vector clip art, and and we have about I think thirty five libraries of you know covering a whole whole range of you know different areas. But I think for sketch noting in particular, the kind of piece that we call make your own objects, uh, you know, which allows yes. you to build your own uh, library, is really powerful because it enables you to keep your style and you know that that it's yours, uh, and you can create you know sketchy um, you know arrows and you know just the standard mm-hmm. or your your people's uh, library of you know people in various poses. 
and uh, you know very quickly drag drag them in, and it keeps your the, the look so it feels like your your sketch notes still, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. you're a lot more efficient because you can uh, you know to kind of tap into these uh, items. And essentially, what you do is you just draw it on the canvas and lasso it, and you can drag and drop it into your library, and boom, it's saved. Uh, it's, uh, it's super simple. And then to add them back on the, the the canvas, just tap, and you know they're there. Take them out. I suppose you could even. It would be a bit tedious, but I suppose you could do headline typeface, you know, lettering, yeah, and have yeah. all the all right. the characters and drag them in. I mean, in some cases, you know, if you were going to redraw them anyway, the the benefit, I guess, of that is the consistency because you would have, I assume, produced the alphabet before, right, and mm-hmm. had it as a library, and then you could drag out the letters and move them around as you like, which is, you know. It's not quite as <laughs> as fast as using the type tool and typing it, mm-hmm. but it's also faster than drawing it from scratch. So there's, you know, there's some really interesting once you start to think about that ways that it could benefit a sketch noter. And then I guess um, can that can you then like if you had built a nice collection of uh, a library of icons, is that something that just a regular person has the ability to offer to the community, or how does that work? Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's a couple of paths there. I mean, you you uh, you could talk to us and about offering it in in our library, uh, and and uh, you know we could come to some arrangement there, and we've done that with some people. Uh, or mm-hmm. you can there is a way that you can share a link uh, with other users. So and and mm-hmm. actually, it's a live share. You know, when uh, that that user can uh, as you add additional things into the library, then they populate in real time. Oh, so, that's interesting. Yeah. So that could be interesting for a team, let's say right. a team of sketch noters who wanted, or a team of creative people who, you know, have done some some work with agencies where they wanted to have a consistent set of icons for all mm-hmm. the work they do. That could be valuable for a team of people to be able to always have the most current uh, library of, of items. That would be really interesting. Yeah, there's some really fun stuff you can do there. So tell us a little bit about the most recent additions to the tool that may be you know, there may be someone who's listening to concepts, maybe they haven't used it for six months or a year, and they're kind of curious to see where things have gone since maybe they gave it a try. Um, what are some new things that have just arrived that you think would be interesting uh, to well, talk about? I, I, I mentioned the kind of align and snap to grid. Um, that's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if, if you want to, I mean, it's, it's more of an architectural uh, focused feature. It, you know, it makes it very easy to really quickly kind of do isometric mm-hmm. drawings, for example. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if you have something that fits a grid a grid pattern that you want to draw, then it's it's very, very quick uh, to, to kind of knock together ideas. That's the, the biggest feature we've launched recently. Uh, uh, like another a feature that, that may be more relevant to, to sketch notices is export selection um, mm. where, where you can now just you know lasso select something export it um, you know so fitting into the workflow I mean one of the things we haven't talked about that we think is really important with concepts is that we know that concepts is 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 part of a workflow that mm-hmm. uh, you know you, you like you, you may particularly after concepts look to move to another tool to, to do something else with what you've created in concepts and so kind of making it really easy to, to make concepts part of a workflow we're not trying to trap you I guess within mm-hmm. within the product mm-hmm. it is something that's very important to us right you know the, the the uses I've used concepts for have been primarily illustration work and with that illustration work I would often bring it into to Adobe Illustrator to make tweaks mm-hmm. and to to size it or to add colors or there was all these different types of things right that I could do Mm -hmm. Uh, and that that's been really beneficial to be to know that I can get it out in a bunch of different ways based on what I want to do the thing you just mentioned too the idea of being able to do a selection could be really interesting with that infinite canvas right because you could have multiple different ideas on a canvas maybe you don't want to show say you had four ideas and one was the winner right so I don't necessarily want to show all four maybe i just want to show one so you could select that and export it and still maintain you know this larger canvas or Mm -hmm. even if it's a defined you know say it's a defined canvas um you could do that too. It's also really interesting for things like, you know, if, you, if, if you're sat next to your Mac and you can lasso select something on your canvas and, and then choose the uh, export to, to clipboard. And with continuity, it's instantly on your Mac and you paste it into a document there. 
you know, the, there's some really, um, you know, fun workflows. Uh, th that works both ways. You can, you know, mm. copy something on Mac and then it immediately shows up on your, your pasteboard on, on iOS and the mm. other way around. So if you do have a kind of a desktop uh, uh, iPad workflow, then some interesting stuff there too. That's really fascinating. I, I feel like I haven't played with concepts very recently and now I'm now I'm being drawn back into the, the concepts gravity field. I think I have to explore it again and see what's new. Uh, another, I mean, it, it's not that new, but it's maybe not that well known. Uh, I think about a year ago, we added uh, a presentation mode. So when you're mm. uh, using AirPlay or on your iPad, you're connected to Zoom, which is obviously something people have been mm -hmm. doing a lot more recently, then mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a special mode um, you know, where the canvas is being presented and the, the tool wheel doesn't show. You just get the pure canvas. Uh -huh. and, um, and, and also on, on your iPad, you see the bars for what the... Uh, other person is seeing so you know the aspect ratios can be different so you kind of mm. know the live area of your canvas uh, that's really interesting you could almost use that in you know if you really made an you were intentionally made a presentation almost like uh, what's the old tool that used to uh i remember where you could sort of zoom in and out you could drag things onto the space mm -hmm. you know over time that could be really interesting i hadn't thought about that that's that's a feature I like to see. I've seen it in a few apps. There's one app I use, um, NoteShelf, that does that, which is really handy because I present and I do sketchnote workshops mm. with it. It allows me to bring in um, images and then draw on top of them. But the nice thing, like you said, is there's no Chrome for anyone to be distracted by. It's just the image and then the drawing, which is really useful. Yes. So I hadn't thought about that. That's that's an interesting feature. Yeah, it's been it's been popular as. Uh, <clears throat> as I say, particularly in the last few months. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, this is just to say, if you're listening uh, at this point, I think you need to download Concepts and play, have a play, because uh, it's really a great tool. As you can hear, David's dedicated with Ben to really making good quality software, and I think um, being aware of that and making use of it is an important thing for us in the Sketchnote community to support the people who are supporting us. And, hey, you know, it's for you, it might be a really great tool, either for some things or maybe for everything. I don't know. Um, it's, it's definitely something to explore for sure. Thanks. Thank you for um, sharing so much of the inside detail with us, David. It's fun to get nerdy about these uh, bits of software for people who are into it. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit now and talk a little about the tools that you like to use. Now, we talked a little bit um, before this, and it sounds like there's not lots of analog stuff that you do, but you do use a fair bit of digital tools. And specifically, we got on the topic of remote tools, or tools that make your team work because you're a distributed team that works remotely together. What are some of the tools that you have found useful that, especially in this time when so many people are working remotely from home or from, from wherever, that have been benefited you over your time, the seven years working on concepts that maybe could benefit listeners to the show. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we we have been distributed from from the very beginning. Um, you know, we uh, we have people uh, spread across the U.S., um, U.K., Netherlands, Finland, uh, China, Japan, South Korea. You know, we're wow. <laughs> very, very spread out. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, our business couldn't function without uh, you know the, the, all of the amazing. You know, there's so many tools to support uh, this type of work uh, nowadays, and you know Slack is obviously um, you know one of the popular ones and is, is foundational. We were, I think, one of the earliest users of Slack. It immediately you know was a fit for for the way we work and and allowed us to kind of. Uh, tie together all the other tools we use in one place so github is where all of our source code goes mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know we use uh, google for for chatting and google docs and figma you know the, mm -hmm. the a, a whole combination of um, of tools but actually i mean i think uh you know the tools that are there to kind of support what we do i think the 
the the real magic of making distributed teamwork teams work is you know is is different i i think it's it's about um, communication and you know making sure everyone understands how important communication is you can't be lazy about communication which maybe mm-hmm. you can be when you're in the same place mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't assume if I have a question, I can just message someone and get an answer. You know, you have to kind of think about your, you know, uh, your day differently and, and kind of plan things to be asynchronous. Uh, I, I think, you know, the more asynchronous you can make everything in your team, the better so that you you don't have these strong dependencies between each other. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, and trust uh, you know we 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 hire people who we trust to get the the job done independently and uh you know we, we don't watch their hours we don't watch you know what day we don't care what days they work or what hours they work uh, mm-hmm. you know we uh we, we really give people the freedom to uh, to work when it you know makes most sense for them and for some people that means you know like eight o'clock at night till six in the morning is when they're most productive mm-hmm. and other people have a more, more traditional day and you know um yeah you know, I, I, have, I have a daughter and my day's fragmented because i spend mm-hmm. parts of it looking after her and other parts you know you know I, i'm making up the time at other times so it's uh the tools definitely help but uh, i think the success of remote teams is is something different it's kind of a mindset i think um i just read a just today, there was an article by Jason Fried of uh, Basecamp, mm. and, he, and his argument was that remote work is a platform, and what he sees is, uh, he sort of related it to porting software. So Microsoft tried to port Windows software onto the Mac, and it didn't work. Um, or in the early days of the web, um, designers, graphic designers, tried to port graphic design to the web, and that didn't work, mm-hmm. right? It was when, when you sort of acted, if you used something natively in the way that it was uh, intended or the things that it did best, that's when it really flourished. And he was making the argument that right now we're seeing because so many people have had to go remote or distributed or whatever you want to call it, um, they're still trying to do these old things. Like, you know, you have five meetings uh, in the real world, but we have to have the same five meetings in, you know, in the the remote world. And his argument is no, not necessarily. His P that's had the same concepts that he talked about, right? This idea of... um, remote is really good at asynchronous and so you should drive towards as much asynchronicity Mm -hmm. as you can because it allows people to focus uh, when they're best and to fit it in to their lives and I think that just makes for a better worker right because if you feel like you've addressed the needs of your family and then you're ready to go like it's just you know it's it's almost like a pure form of when you work you're actually working right right? instead of just I'm here for eight hours and half the time I'm distracted and looking at Facebook and, you know, right. Let's just be real about the fragmentation and the ability to sort of set aside time when you can focus. So it really comes back to mindset. I think Mm -hmm. is sort of what you're, what you're arguing for. And I I would agree having worked remotely for many years in the past, it was definitely a mindset shift and it takes a while. It takes (laughs) it. If you're new to this, this can be really, unusual and you, it takes a while for you to adapt this new way of thinking but it's after a while you, you sort of become uh, addicted to it and it's hard to go back to the other way of working yeah I, i've you know talked to a, a, a lot of friends who you know th- th- are working remotely for the first time and i think one of the common things that comes through is this feeling of guilt that mm-hmm. they're not working enough and you know it, I, I think that's something that's that's really hard to get past. I mean, you know, I, um, I mentioned earlier, I love windsurfing. And mm. uh, it's two o'clock in the afternoon and the wind's howling. Me sitting at my desk and forcing myself to work <laughs> while seeing the trees bending is not the most productive use of my no. time. Whereas going out on the water, you know, just uh, forgetting about everything for two hours and then coming back and probably being in a better mindset to solve the problems mm-hmm. I was stuck on is way more efficient. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, I do much better work that way. And uh, it's, uh, but uh, you know, it's hard for you know companies and managers who've grown up in a in a different system to kind of let go of some of that control. You do have to let go of the control and uh, of uh, 
of like real detailed management of people and mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, i think the the porting you know as an engineer i can definitely empathize with that kind of mm -hmm. porting code i've done it and uh it, it's interesting because actually you know concepts is not uh, is available on ios windows and android and importing uh, concepts to Windows and Android, one of the things we've been very deliberate about is to avoid just transplanting concepts onto Windows. Uh, and it's taking us a lot more time, and it's not at the same level as iOS yet, but we are building it as a Windows app, and so it feels at home on the platform. It's not this mm -hmm. alien experience, and, and it's similar with Android and Chrome OS, where, where we're kind of making each of those versions feel like they they naturally belong there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, Very important. In, in, interesting metaphor. That's an interesting tidbit I hadn't even thought to ask was, uh, for those who are listening who maybe are Surface users or maybe are Android users, that there's actually a really great tool for you to to jump on and start using on those platforms. You know, so many sketchnoters really focus a lot on iPad mm -hmm. Pro and Pencil, naturally, because it's a really good system. But um, there are definitely surfaces out there. I've used them. I think they've improved quite a bit. And I, haven't, I can't say I've used uh, Android much, but I'm sure that with the right tools, it could also be pretty effective. So it's good that you mentioned that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, Apple clearly has has had a lead in that space. Uh, but uh, you know, to your point, the the Surface devices are fantastic, and and mm -hmm. they have a really good stylus. And uh, you know, you you can definitely uh, you know, we we deliver a really good sketching experience. And and Google have done a similar um, uh, thing with Chrome OS, the 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 stylus latency on those, and the, mm. and that's you know much cheaper devices um, compared mm -hmm. to. Um, iOS and, uh, and and Windows and and Samsung too have got some really nice mm. uh, tablets in the market with, mm -hmm. that support stylus. So th there's a lot more choice coming, and uh, yeah, we're we're working hard to kind of deliver that same concepts experience across all all of these platforms. And you know, we hear a lot of people um, you know have have a mixture uh, of devices, mm -hmm. and they want to move between them depending on context. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear that you're covering all those bases and. Good news for those who maybe are on an alternative platform that they that there's an option for them that's mm -hmm. available that maybe they weren't aware of. That's good. Talk to us a little bit now about um, tips that you may have. We we talked a little bit earlier. Again, you're not a huge sketch noter per se, although you know you're coming from more of the engineering perspective. Mm. But you, it sounded like you had some tips that you would love to share with uh, with the audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I talk to a lot of people about about this area, so perhaps uh, some interesting interesting tips. I mean, I think that uh, a common one that that uh, you know many people share is around practice and 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 and, and warming up. Uh, you know, a friend of mine uh, is a, a Disney trained animator who who sketches you know sketches uh, comics professionally still. Uh, you know, he grew up, he learnt. Uh, uh, sketching in, in for, for Disney in the days where it was all done by hand and what really blew me away was that before he starts doing his production work uh, every single day he spends an hour warming up Mm -hmm. Because he can't do his best work <laughs> until mm -hmm. he's spent that hour working up, or you know, warming up. And you know, when, when, when someone who's that level of competence, you know, require it still, you know, needs to to get get them, themselves in the zone. It, you know, it shows you the importance of of kind of that practice and repetition uh, to, uh, mm -hmm. to 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 master the art. I guess. Yeah, I I can definitely relate to that. There, usually, if I'm doing sketch noting. I've sort of built in time for my 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 stretching and sort of sketching and getting in the zone. It's almost like you're just sort of syncing everything up in a lot of ways mm -hmm. so that you're ready because if I go I, I can definitely see when I go go in cold if I just suddenly decide oh, I'm going to sketch note this like uh I see that sometimes it can be a challenge and I'll tend to fall back to my defaults where you know I'm writing too much or I'm you know whatever those things are that that I'm trying to elevate out of without the stretching and preparation. Yeah, it's kind of getting your mind in that right mode, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So that's a great one. What's What else do you have for us? I mean, I, I guess something, you know, we, we as a company uh, can offer back to the community is we have uh, our, our YouTube channel, which you'll find at Concepts app. 
it has a learn to draw series uh, mm, so we uh, which is free uh, we three parts so far we intend you know we, we're working on a part four at the moment uh, and, and it's not focused on concepts we, we you know we, we include kind of paper and pen in, 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 in there as well it's uh, very kind of broad uh, and, and the goal is to provide a really good resource to help people uh, you know get, get the basics of sketching mm-hmm and the last, I think, you know, which ties into what we do with concepts, uh, but I think also applies to any creative activity uh, is is asking for feedback, and particularly from people you trust. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's uh, asking what people think and, and, and what you might be able to do better or how you can uh, how you can improve is, I think, one of the most powerful, you know, things you can do, whatever you're doing in life. Uh, it's certainly something we do with concepts all the time. Mm. Um, we, we make it very easy for people to contact us and we proactively go out and and ask people um, when we're developing new features in particular what people think of them Mm. i know i was on the beta list for a little while and that was fun to see things coming uh that were close to being released and to explore and give feedback um i found that i ended up not having as much time as i imagined i did so i stepped off of that but it was really great to see how that worked and how active it really made me aware of how active your team was in producing uh, and being really careful and uh, very interested in feedback. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's you know something we're very grateful for. I mean, to your point, it takes it takes people time to give us feedback, and and so you know we're we're always very welcoming when people spend the time to share share with us. Uh, it's, uh, it's 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 so valuable. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been a really fun discussion. I'm, I've learned, you know, I'm, I'm a concepts user and I learned lots of things about the tool and I can imagine maybe somebody who uses other tools and hasn't explored it for a while uh, will be curious. How, how can people reach out and find the tool and then also reach out to you if they wanted to give feedback or just uh, get in touch? Yeah, sure. Uh, so our website is concepts.app. Uh, so pretty easy to find and you can find links to download uh, for all the platforms there um, and you can email me david at concepts.app uh, so uh, uh, pretty easy to find me you can put those in the show notes I guess as well Mike if- will do will do we've got I've got lots of things uh, when, as we go back through we'll capture all the great links and make sure we share those with people as we always do until the next episode of the Sketch Note Army podcast This is Mike and David signing off until the next episode. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of the show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code Rohde40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show. 